We're going live. All right, welcome everybody to Insight Aviation, sponsored by Wayman Aviation Academy. Learn to fly here in sunny South Florida, between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. We are an international flight school, taking students from all around the world, including many great ones from the Caribbean, like our captain here from Jamaica, as well as lots of great domestic students that are taking advantage of our 100% financing option now, courtesy of Maritides Financial Loans. That means that a student that's interested in learning how to fly can now get funded all the way from their private and instrument, all the way to their commercial license, CFI, get a job flying with this flight academy, and then interview with our six airline partners, you know, get that dream job you always wanted. And that's kind of what we're here to talk about, right? Inside Aviation is all about hearing from experienced pilots, uh, captains, air traffic controllers, professionals in the aviation industry, that are there, they've made it, right? And so we wanna hear how they got there, um, what their career was like, the tips and tricks that they would advise to those aspiring pilots coming up behind them. And, uh, and then of course, take questions and answers from those of you that are in our, uh, in, in live in our Zoom and also on our Facebook Live. Feel free to put questions in there. We'll, we'll tackle them at the end or as they come around. And one thing I love to do is let us know where you're from in the chat either what country or what city you're from. So maybe we can tailor our, our feedback from you. Do we have any Caribbean uh, students? We have lots here at Wayman Aviation Academy. I hope we definitely have some uh, Caribbean pilots uh, on the Facebook Live or in the Zoom. Feel free to use the chat. So uh, without further ado, allow me to introduce Captain Maria Ziadi Haddad. Uh, and we're gonna get to know how she came to have that great title as well as so many titles. She's a very accomplished pilot, 747 captain, Jamaican Air, Atlas Air. Uh, or, so uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Maria? What, how would you kind of- Hi, Eddie. Up? Hi, everybody. Let me turn down my phone to begin with. Perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, that never fails, eh? Um, well, aviation. Um, there's no one in my family who was involved in aviation. It was more of the friends of my parents in Manteca Bay, Jamaica. I never had any role models or mentors, but because I was so curious and always asking, my mom took myself and my sister up on a small plane ride, a 172 back in the day with a pilot, Ken Rutter. He had Rotier in Manteca Bay and Kinston. We went flying around the countryside in Jamaica. So it was just fun. I was like five. Uh, oh, yeah. fast yeah, fast forward 12 years later, always interesting. Hey, you know, what would this be like? But I was always socialized and taught in school, you know, career talks. This is in the 50s and 60s to either be a nurse, a teacher, a flight attendant, you know, housewife. We were taught to go into science, space, aviation. Oh, it would be good to do this. So when I came back home and I, I started flying as a flight attendant, I thought it would be a part-time job. It ended up being three and a half years. I... I took a fan flight again, and it was a great discovery, and I got hooked, bitten by the bug, went back to the flying school, Tinson Penn, Kingston, Jamaica, and I started the private pilot course. So I was a flight attendant working, doing that, paying for that, because no one would fund it. They didn't take me seriously. Sure. And uh, it was through Emory Riddle, I was doing the correspondence courses at the time. Oh, oh excellent. Right. So um, I did the private pilot, and I said to a few of the guys there who were with Air Jamaica's pilots, you know, where, where will this go? You know, why continue? And they said, no, 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 we have um, a, a female flight instructor. She was a first in Jamaica in 1950s or whatever. And uh, they said, you could be an instructor like her. And eventually the airlines would open up. So I continued to do that. And I received a government loan in Jamaica. And I came to the U.S. to Opelaka Flight Center at Opelaka. Okay. And a student student visa, Tercer, George Perry, Burnside Ott. And because I was on the student visa, I was not a U.S. resident, I did it within the six months, you know, really worked hard on it, went out pr pretty much every day, doing four hours of flying, getting everything down pat. So I got the commercial multi and instrument here in 1976. Then I returned back to Jamaica, continued working, and then I had to convert the FA licenses to the ICAO, the Jamaican CAA uh, equivalent. So in about 78, early 78, by then I had my Jamaican flight instructor rating from nice. flying school. I gave up the flight attendant job, went there to do flight instructing. So I did that between the two small schools there, ground instructing, flight instructing, every now and then charter pilot work. 
What do you and use? 1979, the ad came out and I had everything. I had the education requirements. I had only maybe eight or 900 hours, but their minimum requirement was 250 hours. It was basically yeah. having an issue. You'd start as a flight engineer, second officer. So I had all the requirements and um, it was very hard for them to say no. <laughs> and uh, that's when I broke into the aviation world. And that was March 1979, 727 second officer. And from, from there on, I moved a couple years later to the A300B4, did the course in Toulouse, France. About maybe five years later, upgraded to first officer on the A300. And about 17 years in all, in 1995, 1996, I was up for command. So I had to go back over to the 727 as first officer, then captain. And mm -hmm. after that, it was the A320. Air Jamaica closed around 94, it reopened, and then they closed again in 2010. Mm -hmm. So that's when I moved on to the US. And um, hey, but I thought that, that was it. But before we dive further into your airline career, like you covered a lot of stuff right there in the beginning, right? So um, you, the, the idea of aviation seems to have always kind of been buzzing around. Is it you had friends of the family that were in aviation, right? Yes. So I find that interesting because I, I, students tend to fall into two categories, right? Someone who's like in the world of aviation and someone that comes from nothing, like they have no experience, they just like the idea and they take that discovery flight and they're like, yes, this is it. And they go, right? Now you are kind of somewhere in between, right? Because you were close enough to aviation to go on a discovery flight when you were pretty young, right? And yes. you were uh, advised or guided or found your way to being a flight attendant, right? Which is excellent because I can't tell you how many students we've had that have been successful moving from the cabin to the cockpit. It's yeah. a great step because they already kind of understand the lifestyle, a lot of the terminology, a lot of the lingo is already there. And so whenever we've had uh, people trying to make that jump, whether, I mean, we've had American Airlines, Delta, Spirit, uh, flight attendants, cabin crew, and mechanics, of course, make the jump yeah. over to pilot. And they tend, it tends to work out really well. Um, yeah. So you're learning to fly there independently, paying your lessons as you go. And so how long was that process from private to instructor? Uh, the private was around May, November 1975 and to an instructor was late 77. That was two years. And if yeah. I had money in the time and I could have gotten the leave for work easily within two years, I know people who did it within a year. So it's always about the time and the money. It's true. But two years is great. Actually, two years is yeah. really good um, yeah. for the time and effort it takes to get in there. And then you're paying your dues, right? As a flight instructor, gaining your experience so that when you when the door opens up, yes. you're an 800, 900 hour pilot not a 250 hour, you know, fresh out of the flight school Correct. student. Correct. So if I recall, you were one of the very first female pilots at Air Jamaica. Is that right? I was the first. The, the first. first. The first, yeah. All right. I knew you were the first the, captain. No, That's excellent. So there was no one before me to be a role model or a mentor, you know. Yeah. That's your trailblazer. That's very it's exciting, but I'm sure it was very uh, daunting at the time. It, uh, it was still is actually when you sit down and you think about it yeah but we had we had i had a lot of support there were the naysayers there were those who who didn't want it and then there were those who supported it didn't see why not and who provided help but of course i had to do the work that was required you had to be prepared you had to work hard study you know try and keep up with your proficiency and your skills fortunately i always um passed every check ride never had a problem in my 40 something year career. Excellent. Yeah. Had issues, but you worked it out. You usually good instructors. Well, I mean, it's good to have, you know, to be the first, but also be exemplary, keeps the door open for people behind you, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very lucky at this flight academy that we have a pretty high percentage of female students. You know, the, the industry average is like 7%, something like that. And yes. I think mostly through the efforts of Katie, who you know very well at the 99s. Yes, and hi, Katie. Yes, I'm sure she's watching. And, uh, and Rosa, uh, our, my sister, who's director of uh, operations and handles all the visas, she's always been very like, we need to have female instructors. We need to increase our female students. We had a female chief pilot in the 90s. She was wonderful. 
uh, Tina, she was uh, Swedish, uh, wonderful uh, chief pilot at the time. And so it's, it's kind of been built into our DNA. And now um, through Katie's leadership and things like that, we even have our first student club is the Wayman Angels. And it's all about our female students kind of coming together to support each other and do activities around the school. It's very exciting. Yeah, that, that's good that they, they uh, very rarely a view our DME, but you know, you have to prove that you can do a non-position approach. So it could be an RNAV or, or VOR or even a localized approach. And the quality of the airport you're flying into changes dramatically, like from the US and Europe to, you know, flying into a, maybe a military support somewhere in the Mideast or in South America. So I'm, I'm sure you have a variety of different things. You, you've got to be ready for whatever you get. Yes. And uh, with that airline, of course, they had, you know, the briefing. You, you, you're you supposed to read up on the briefing for each airport in the city you're going to. So even for your students there, you know, briefings are very important. And uh, seeking information on the airport on your cross country, whatever it is, having your charts, reading up on all the notams, very key. I bet. Yeah, it's a bad habit. We're always kind of reinforcing that. Did you read the notams? Did you read the notams? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, previous, well, the, the last two airlines, notams was part of your departure brief, arrival briefing. It was big time. Notams, because those are the gotchas, along yeah. with, of course, weather. You know, and your uh, hole short and your hot spots, things like that. Well, flying around here locally in South Florida, there's been no short of TFRs. Thank goodness the election season is over, because <laughs> I feel yeah. like every single week somebody was in town, uh, yeah. and it, it definitely was messing with our schedules. Uh, so one of the questions that I, so you had, you had the opportunity to talk to our student body just last week, just for a short little hello, and uh, the, I have a lot of questions came out of that. But really people, when I talk to people, they really kind of wanted to hear like what your favorites were or the more interesting places you ever flew into, either with Air Jamaica or with uh, Atlas. Do you have any favorites? Uh, with Air Jamaica, my favorites were like Los Angeles. We had layovers and I just enjoyed going around uh, Santa Monica or the promenades or going to Disney. So it was places like that or just going to Chicago downtown. It was different coming from the islands, of course. True. Um, when I went to, so we didn't have too many layovers, but anywhere we went that we could do it safely and preferably with someone else or a group, we would go out and tour the city. With yeah. Atlas, of course, many countries. So I'd already been to Europe, but it was great. I enjoyed Amsterdam, uh, Germany, Beautiful city. and Italy. And then uh, the first I went into the United Arab Emirates, Dubai, Sharjah, and uh, Abu Dhabi. Went yeah. to Qatar, we had layovers in Kuwait because we take the military through Kuwait also and cargo. And the first I ever went into Asia, of course, was with Atlas. We would go to Japan, Narita, Nagoya, South Korea, Incheon or Seoul, and mm -hmm. um, Shanghai. Did Shanghai, did quite a few layovers there and sightseeing. Uh, very very interesting. Town. Huge. I love the, the Bund in that whole area there in Shanghai. Yeah. That's a New York of China. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It is really, really astounding what they're doing. So I, I've got to keep thinking back because, you know, places uh, in the Middle East, like, you know, Arab Emirates and even China aren't as, uh, as up to date with females, you know, doing roles, like coming in the captain of a 747. I mean, is, is there a little bit of a culture difference when you land there or people just kind of see the stripes and they get with it? Uh, for some people, it was surprising, but I mean, there have been women who have been doing this decades before me. Uh, yeah. Some places, you know, it, they'd be just all over you. They'd just be so happy to see a female captain. And some places like Saudi Arabia, uh, not at all. You really don't mm -hmm. even want to talk on the radio. And if you were doing the Hajj or any of those pilgrimage flights, they would require that you cover up. So I never bid to do those. I got out. Yes. Saudi yeah. Arabia, definitely. But then we'd go into a place like Bahrain or Qatar or Kuwait, which was close by. Mm. And it was pretty modern. Yeah, um, yeah. But of course, I, you know, dress conservatively. I personally dress conservatively. Sure. Um, the streets, you know, to respect for other people. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, just one of those unique things about being a pilot, right, is that uh, you you sample those cultures from around the world. I mean, I, I can think of lots of people that have never left their hometown or their state and, 
you know, uh, a pilot is lucky enough to get paid to fly into the opposite side of the world, right? And meet people and try food. I feel like half the pilots I meet are like real foodies. <laughs> They're into trying all sorts of different new foods. You are, you are, no, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of places I went to, I did not experiment with the food. I'm not into eating certain, certain things, or some people did. They went, you know, AWOL and that. Um, <laughs> You know, when you're, you're trying, it sounds very glamorous. It is glamorous. It can be. But sometimes when you go, you don't have enough time to go and savor the country or the city that you're in. There's this chorus. You've just mm -hmm. come across the Atlantic. You have all these time zones and jet lag and you're bushed and you have to be ready for the next flight. So, and then there's COVID. A lot yeah. of these we went to were level three uh, red CDC countries. The only time we could go out is if we went to a supermarket and you proved it with buying something and you had to be, you know, with a mask even outside. So in mm -hmm. Spain, in Zaragoza, for example, or Mati, we would go and it would be to the supermarket, but you couldn't go and sightsee. Mm -hmm. And we shut it down for a while. There were no layovers because the testing was so restricted. Australia, yeah. Sydney, I think up to recently, you were locked down in your bedroom. And if you, if you, accidentally come out and the door closes you have to get a new key and we heard that they would call the police to find out why you left the room oh wow <laughs> right now in covid it's a time to it is, it is a crazy time for you to be uh you know an interesting way to wrap up your, yeah. your 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 heavy airline time but you're absolutely right you know i know somebody uh, who flew a citation down to peru just last week and they weren't allowed off the aircraft while they were refueling right uh, and I was like, well, what about your, your post-flight, your pre-flight? They're like, we just had to go, right? And then uh, Captain Petrovic just the other, the other day was telling me that he ended up spending three days in his hotel room in Tel Aviv before he could come back. Yeah, Israel is another one. Uh, Israel, we were in Brazil and I've been into Santiago, Chile and technically you weren't supposed to leave the hotel. And I know the crews in Israel, we did some charters into Tel Aviv. I didn't go, but they were basically locked into the hotel. You, you couldn't, they, they knew that you couldn't leave the hotel. You'd be locked out of the hotel. It's so it's a different time. time now, you know? It is, it is. It's, uh, it's a learning curve. I guess we're all getting used to this and uh, it has impacted the aviation industry so differently. But uh, you know, before we even touch on that, I wanna ask uh, our viewers, you know, we've got lots of people on the Zoom. Thanks everyone for joining us. And also on the Facebook, we had to reconnect our Facebook because something happened there with the canals, uh, connections. But, uh, before we get much farther into our interview, I'd love to hear from our from our listeners or viewers. If you have any questions, of course, for Captain Maria, and let us know where you're from, right? So in the in the chat, in the comments, let us know what country you're from. I see somebody here said they're from Antigua, so you've got uh, some Caribbean friends watching. Uh, Hi. So it's, it's very interesting for them. India. Um, India. I see India as well, and the Colombia here earlier. Um, so you mentioned the time zones and you, you touched on this last time, just about time management, because I think that's something that's kind of maybe not unique, but very important for uh, someone who's going into the pilot world is managing their time across time zones, right? That's a question I get quite often from at career days, like how, how, do, how do you handle it? How, are you strict about it? Do you go with the flow? Um, well, it depends. Um, most of the flights that were, say, over eight hours, mm -hmm. my previous carrier, had to have an additional person. Sometimes the duty days were 20 to 22 hours, so it'd be four of us on the 7-4. So yes, you have to be very cognizant of that, try and do your best to be rested. And when you sign your flight plan, you're, you're certifying that you're fit to fly and that you're rested. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want to be pretty prepared for that. And usually when we get together, especially as a captain, you'd say, you know, how is everybody who wants first rest? You try and meter out the rest, whether it's a half or a third. If somebody was really feeling bad, you can feel bad, like, like you're going out and after takeoff, you say, boy, you know, I wanted a third break, but I, I really would prefer the second break. We usually try to work on that. Um, sure. I found when I got going, me personally, eating properly, vitamins were very important for me and exercise and hydration for me to feel better. And um, if I really started to feel uh, like sleepy or groggy and it wasn't my time to go for a break, I would decide whether, when, and, when and where I would take caffeine. Now, caffeine itself can fatigue you. That's so I, I, was, I was very careful about the use of caffeine. And um, it was more about just, to me, nutrition and vitamins. That, that was, but when I got to where 
I, I um, was uh, supposed to go, the destination, we would then look at how much time we had. Did we have 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, whatever, and then sometimes you work back. How do you want to play this game? Do you want to get into that time zone or do you want to keep your watch on home time zone? So there's some guys and gals who would do that. They'd keep their watch, they would eat and sleep exactly as they did at home. I found that did not work for me. I always found a way to have a rest, if not eight hours, at least 46 hours of 45. Very important, the I am safe uh, checklist, which all pilots get to know very well. You know, we've been going through that recently here. We had a student that made a great video about it, said, uh, maybe I'll share it here at the end of the presentation. But it's, uh, for those of you that are just getting into it, so, you know, the, the they say the pilot is the heart and the soul of the airplane, right? The airplane is the machine. So you have want to have a healthy heart and soul, right? So are you under any stress, any fatigue, uh, any alcohol or drugs, um, any of those things that might impact you emotionally being in the aircraft, right? Um, when you're in a multi-crew situation, there's a little bit of redundancy, right? But, you know, those of us that are coming through it right now, single operation charter pilots or part 91 or things like that, you have to have that ultimate, you know, pilot in command and you have to recognize it in yourself. Also, uh, the previous carrier, you, you could uh, call fatigue at any time, basically. So if you got your wave of call and you felt fatigued, like you didn't sleep, there were banging on the door, there was a fire alarm, what, whatever, or you just didn't sleep, you could you could say, look, I'm fatigued. Of course, that required a report and that went to the A, but yeah. you could do that. Not everywhere you can do that. So like That's I said, true. you have to be very careful and responsible with how you, how you try to rest before a flight. Sure. Yeah, you know, a lot of people are, are really involved in the dream of being a pilot, but it's a job. It is work, you know, you've got to show up, you've got to be uh, awake and present. And I don't think there's many jobs like this where you are truly present, right? When you're flying, you're fully engaged. Uh, automation's made that a little easier, but it's also kind of a double-edged sword. It, 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 sitting with all automation can be boring, very routine, and that's what you have to guard against. You know, uh, you're doing a night flight and you're in the win window circadian low, like at two, three o'clock in the morning, You you can, you can nod if you're not careful and someone's not there to monitor. And what I would do is every half an hour to hour, especially on freighters, because it was easy to just get up and go to the lab or the galley would say, we're going to take a five, get up, go. And of course, hand over correctly and all that. You go. Passenger flying, of course, is different. You have to have the flight attendants let you out and guard the door and so on. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have to just get up physiologically to stay alert. Mm -hmm. This is very easy if you're doing 16, 17 hours which we do from Hong Kong, Cincinnati, for example, or Cincinnati with the Bahrain, it could be long haul. Well, they're very yeah. long hauls. Yeah, four of you and you have to, as I said, uh, divide up your, your rest and try and be alert. So outside of your 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 day job, it seems to be like multi-day, multi-days, right? Um, you're very active in lots of different groups and organizations. Like, like we mentioned earlier, I know you met Katie through the 99s. Um, so, I'm a big fan of these organizations, the uh, 99s, the Latino Pilots Association, the Organization for Black Aviation Professionals, uh, Women in Aviation. There's so many of them. Um, can you kind of share with us how you got involved and uh, what impact they've had for you? Okay. Well, I'd always heard of the 99s. I wasn't a member too much later, but the one that I, I heard of first was the International Society of Women Airline Pilots, ISA. And that was formed in 1978 by 21 original pioneering airline pilots in the in the US. So I became a member of that in 81. And that was through, I don't even know how, how that came about. Somebody may have written a letter because I would write, we never had internet. So I'd write sure. the pioneers of American and wherever had these, these, these first female pilots, they would write me back. And I think somebody wrote me back and said, hey, we're having a meeting in Denver. And I got the information, went to Denver. It was like a whole new because there were all these women, like about a hundred of them who were like me. They were doing a job like me. We spoke about mm -hmm. uniforms. You wear nail polish and makeup. And uh, how can you keep your hair? Because back in the day, they were very strict, like no makeup, no nail polish, hair back. What was maternity leave like? Things like that. So yeah. so I learned a lot from, from that you know, organization. Later on, I joined the 99s. And I'm a member of the Florida Gold Coast 99s. And we try and have regular monthly meetings and, and flyings. We just had a little Christmas thing on Zoom. Nice. 
There's also women in aviation, as you know, they also have um, very large group group. conference. Sorry. That's a very large group. Women in aviation has grown. Yes, a lot. and so is the 99s. They, they're, they're international also. And there, there are many scholarships that aspiring pilots can get from these groups. Um, there's um, there's there's OBAP. Um, I have friends with OBAP. I'm not a member of OBAP, but they do awesome work. That's another good one to join. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as far as years I've done, I've done uh, like a leadership role in the ISA group and in the local women in aviation group. Nice. Which has helped. Yeah. What I hear mostly is uh, the mentorship is is a big component of these organizations. Right, which is huge. You know, for somebody like yourself that didn't have that obvious connection into the airlines, you know, to have somebody that's five, ten years ahead of you down that road, I'm sure is extremely helpful. Did you mentor people in those organizations or anything like that? Um, yes, but also um, in Jamaica, you know, you do a career day talk. Yes. Or go like this on a Zoom or you're on the radio or the TV. Mm -hmm. That without realizing you're mentoring people, you're you're giving back. So, so yes, I was always involved in, in something like that. And I was also involved in our Pilots Union, our Pilots Association in Jamaica. And um, various committee committee level work you do mm -hmm. would eventually help the entire pilot body, not just not just women. It's true. No, it's very good. And yeah. it's, you know, especially for right now in like this COVID situation where so many people are saying, well, okay, maybe I'm not doing an airline this year, maybe in another year or two. I think it's a good time, a good opportunity to reach out, give a helping hand, join one of the organizations and network, you Absolutely. know, growing network. And I'm a huge fan of career days. I love going to a career day wearing, wearing my stripes because you don't have to explain what you're doing, right? I remember I did a career day at my son's school and the woman in front of me was a, like a patent attorney, right? So she probably spent half her time just explaining what a patent was and then second, what an attorney was, <laughs> right? So I, I come in wearing the, the white shirt and the stripes as a pilot, and you don't have to explain anything. You just talk about airplanes for half an hour. <laughs> That's true. So yeah. it, it's very, I think it's key for your students um, to get involved with the groups. As you said before, networking, connections, camaraderie, and of course, education. You'll learn something. And it so looks good on a resume. Looks great on a resume. It's a nice, yeah. especially if it's a leadership role, right? Like if you can say you're the vice exactly. president or treasurer yeah. or committee chair. Yes. yes. It definitely stands out. So we had quite a few nice questions come in. Um, a, a common one that I'm seeing a lot is uh, if you had, well, we kind of touched on this. If you had a favorite destination or favorite airport to land or take off from, we kind of already touched on that. You had a long list, actually. <laughs> yes, uh, um, there are many, Hong Kong, Amsterdam, Quito, Ecuador, high altitude, yes. different. Yeah, that's interesting because people usually don't usually don't mention Quito, Ecuador as like a favorite. That's interesting. Um, it was challenging. Yeah, high altitude, I, I, yeah, and we would yeah. take flowers out of there, and the flowers would come through to Miami and then over to Amsterdam. Really? Because it's funny because you always think of tulips coming out of Amsterdam, but I hadn't thought about flowers going. Well, into roses Amsterdam. would leave uh, Quito and go into Amsterdam. It's mainly right. roses. Yeah, it, it, I think you really get to see like the worldwide economy in action when yes. you're a pilot, like what's moving where and how. Yeah. Exactly. So of course, there's the eternal question that's here. You, you've had a chance to fly Boeing and Airbus. Which one, which one do you prefer? Uh, the, the easy answer would be Airbus. The fly-by-wire, and I found it very gentle, very easy. Although a 747 was always a dream. So um, I've, I've flown that dream and also the Dash 8 of the 74 was, was somewhat uh, fly-by-wire, but the, the Airbuses are, are very easy to handle, very spacious cockpits. They were very much ahead of their time. Yeah, it's, it's kind of the, the what I hear as well. Kind of, a lot of people, when you think of an airliner, a jet, you think the 747 is what comes to mind, right? It's the queen, right? So, it comes well, to I'm very, I'm very happy that I, I flew it. You know, it's, it's a nice end to a career, actually. Beautiful. You know, it's a great, great opportunity. You know, if I could get a flight again, I would. But if you're talking about favorite, I would say from ease and comfort and so on, it was Airbus. That was the one I flew the longest too. That was over 13 years on a 320 and about 10 on an A300. So. All right. 
So uh, here's a, I'm going to put a spin here on Brian's question. He wants to know what the best flight school is in Jamaica. And maybe you're not at liberty to say what it is, but maybe I can spin that. I'm kind of curious. Um, we have a lot of international students that start their flying outside the country, right? In Jamaica, in Peru, in Colombia, and they finish their flight training in the US, like much like you did at Opelaka. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a, it's a ways back now, but what do you think about that difference between learning to fly in your home country versus the US? I mean, they're pretty different. Very different topography to, and, and climate, you know, the tropics and the mountains and so on was very different. A much smaller airport to say Opelok. Opelok was very busy, pretty mm -hmm. flat in Florida. <clears throat> yes. A lot of radar services. <coughs> Excuse me. It was just completely different. Yeah, no, they're very different. I mean, one of the things, I forget who I was talking to about this uh, on one of our previous uh, interviews, was that if you learn to fly, like, like myself, I'm from Peru, and I've visited probably most of the schools in Peru. Uh, <coughs> No problem. If you need to get a water, go right ahead. Um, I found that they're, uh, you know, they're they're good schools. They've got great instructors. They're well intentioned, but it's so hard to get parts and maintenance and replacement parts, and so the airplanes aren't always down. And then there's the uh, the flying environment, like you said, in all of Peru. I think there's like three or four episodes that have instrument approaches, and in Florida alone, there's 93 airports that have instrument approaches. So like the experience you get is a magnitude different. Uh, well, in my day, there were no instrument approaches, no ILSs. There were VORs and NDBs. Right now, there's no operational flying school that I know of in Jamaica. They're waiting no. for from the JC. Yeah, there are issues down there. Wow, it definitely sounds like it. Well, we've had, you know what? That would explain why we've had so many great Jamaican students here in the US. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, if you're calling to us from Jamaica and you want to fly, we've Definitely had great pilots come out of here. Let us know. We'll be happy to help you with the student visas and all those things. Um, so we have five small round now. Last time we talked, you touched on a lot of interesting things about study habits and uh, and kind of who you surround yourself with as you're coming up. Uh, can you tell us about your study experience when you're studying for check rides, studying for uh, uh, recertifications and things like that? Well, as I said, uh, self-discipline. Uh, try to remove the temptations for me, social media, the TV and noise and uh, schedule. Like if, like I'm going back into aviation teaching, uh, if I get through, it could be some four, A320 and the simulators, I would need to get back, especially to the A320. I would want to schedule so much time per day. It could be an hour to four hours, depending on the time you have and staying away from certain things that you know will distract you. Of course, now it's Christmas and so on. So, sure. so much for that. Um, as, a, as a student, try and get good study buddies, good hangar flying folks around you. And um, when I was at Atlas, for example, I did very well with certain study partners. We would do groups. We would study before our sim, after sim for debriefing and hear what the other person is saying. So if you have a very good role model that will keep you on that straight and narrow path, that, that would be the ideal. So that's what I meant about keeping good company and people who will uplift you, but yet tell you what, what you need to hear. You might need to hear something and maybe your instructor is trying to tell you that, but your friends, maybe a family member needs, needs, needs to say to you, like, maybe you're not meant for flying or you're meant for flying, but this is what you need to try or this is what you need to do. You need to be punctual or on time or more organized or whatever it is, or, you know, uh, we've come across people who've had hygiene issues. You know, you need to, you know, take a, a daily shower or something like that. I'm going to be perfect. honest with you. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you, mentioned so sometimes... you, you mentioned punctuality, which is something that we're always fighting with, right? Because we're here in South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Miami. And so there is this concept of Caribbean time, right? So being a captain from Jamaica, I imagine you've had to fight Caribbean time. Yeah, I, well, I never had that issue. I'm, I'm actually usually usually on time or early, and um, I guess from school days with my parents, I always learned to be on time. And it's about being prepared, being prepared for the next day, the next morning, or the next appointment that you have. Yes, sometimes you can run behind or you're not organized, and I don't like being disorganized. So I find for me, knowing the schedule, being organized, making notes, like at the end of the day, okay, make a note, this is what I got to get done today. <clears throat> Because I'm also a wife and a mother, and I run a house. It's true. And you have things to do, you know? 
could be a to to-do list. I always have <laughs> exactly. my to-do list. You know, your calendar, you have no excuse. Your phone has a calendar. Mm. Your phone has an alarm. Your phone even has world clock on it. So when I'd be in Japan, okay, what, what time is it? You know, do I have to make this call? Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes you'll slip up. It's human, but you can make the effort. If you want to go into the airlines or uh, a good 135 job or whatever job it is, if you're punctual, and you're aware and you're organized, you're an asset right there to yourself and others. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. You know, we, we receive uh, Abby Nisho very, you know, from zero hour students, right? So something that I'm always talking to our instructors about is primacy, all right? Like now is the time to instill good habits. And a lot of private pilots kind of stumble through their private because they don't even, they don't know what to expect. And how could you, right? You don't know what you don't know. And so- it's yeah, and so a lot of them are learning how to study, learning how to be punctual, uh, responsive, just a basic responsibility level. And so I see that most additional training, most struggling happens at the private pilot level. And after you pass that check ride, students kind of wake up They're like, oh, okay, yeah. that's what I've got to yeah. do. And the instrument yeah. and the commercial and so on, they, they all just go much better. Yeah, it, it, that, that is a norm, but I have come across one or two very small percentage of airline pilots who still come late and then when you're spoken to then sometimes they pick it up when they realize that people are speaking to them way too much you know it can impact your job negatively so if you want to go somewhere in life you don't have to be a pilot it can be anything you, you kind of want to consider other people's time oh, get it could be yeah. your own business <laughs> yeah that's true if you want to follow your own clock start your own business um so as we're coming to kind of the end of our hour uh, words of wisdom, you know, what, what would you like to impart on some of our aspiring pilots that are watching now or, or maybe starting to make that move from uh, into their first pilot job? Well, I would say uh, be determined, uh, persistent, don't give up. If this is what you want to do and you realize it's your passion, your love, it's not, it's not for just money. If not, you'll be very disappointed if you're going just for the money and the perks. This is because you really love it. This is what you really want to do because there, there'll be many disappointments along the way between ups and downs, furloughing, um, maybe a check ride or somebody you're flying with you don't like. So make sure you really, really want to do this. Be determined, disciplined, and, and focused. You know? Ensure you have your goals in mind. If not, seek help from a good family member or friend. That, that's basically it, living the dream, staying, mm -hmm. staying focused on it and being determined. Let's, let's take a moment on that because uh, you mentioned that there's disappointments on the road, right? There's lots of ups and downs. Aviation is cyclical. And right now we're in the midst of this downturn. Now, I imagine in your career, you've been through 9-11, you've been through the downturns, you've been through an airline closing twice. Yes. Um, you know, how, I'm sure when you're in that moment, it feels terrible. What can you tell us? Like, how, how do you get through them? I, I well take a very honest look at things. And if um, if you see that there's hope or light at the end of the tunnel, like we had to go back through interview processes and you have to have a, a sense of self-worth and self-esteem and know that you could do it. That's the first thing. If you have a good clean record, you, you know you could do it. Now, um, <clears throat> when I came over to Atlas, I never thought I'd go back into aviation. It was my family that said, no, you know, it's too, you're too young to give this up. And when I finally decided and made it finally decided that this is what i wanted to do and why not it was it all worked out you that's what i'm saying you have to have in your mind what you want to do have an idea of what you want to do and what you are about what do you have to offer what are, what is your skill set and in the meantime prepare for that next opportunity yeah. right now i'm hard from one phase of aba so all along i'm trying to figure out what next this is what i want to do this is skills i have prepare for that you you can create your future. Absolutely. Right. You have to go out there and um, if the time's not right, one day the time might be right, but you have to be honest about that. Will, will your time ever be? Will your ship come into the harbor? You know? Mm -hmm. So some of it is about being very, very positive in your mind, you know, thinking about this day and night, this is what you want to be and see how you can create that. I You've got to stay positive. Have positive people around you. That's very important. Yeah. People that know you and you, you trust and, and help up, uplift you, like you said. I like that. You uh, just have to know if everybody else is saying no, this one won't, won't work. But there's a seed in you. There's something that's enlightening you that this is for you. Then you have to be patient, 
and you have to have that faith. Whatever it is that you practice or preach, you have to have that within you to to create that. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. Well, Captain Maria, we're coming to the end of our hour. I have to thank you so much for sharing your wisdom on your uh, sharing your amazing career uh, from right here, uh, not that far away from Jamaica to flying globally in the 747. You really are living the dream. And I wish you success on your next steps going to the simulator uh, training world, uh, continuing with aviation and what you know. Uh, to everyone that's on the chat, you know, feel free to keep sending questions or commenting on the videos. Um, we, we always go back and answer any questions and we'll share any questions you might have uh, with Captain Maria. Uh, Captain Maria, is, if people wanted to reach out to you or any of the organizations that you support, uh, where would you direct them? Well, they can, um, if you want, they can send me an email, Eddie, if you have my email. All right, if anyone's interested, feel, feel free to reach out to us in the comments and I can share that contact for you. And then I'll, yeah, because some of the organizations like the ISA, it's for women airline pilots. Right. And I think January 1st, they may open up to the aspiring women. They're doing a new type of membership. Right. Yes. So exactly. if they email, then I can peruse it and see where it fits in. That's excellent. That's excellent. Okay. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And for everyone that's watching, feel free to check out wayman.edu if you're interested in pursuing your own flight training dreams. Uh, that's what we do. We try to help you get out there uh, to wear those stripes and get to know the world. All right. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Maria. Thank you to Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.